The question that we've got before us is prisons, where do the communities come in or where do communities come in? And both speakers have, in very intelligent ways, said that's a wrong question. But me, my blunt ways, I don't get the question. Because the prison, as we all agree, is meant to be part of the community. And it's like, I tried to explain this to a member of my staff yesterday when I was trying to get my head around it. Because I've been trying to get my head around it for quite a while. It just yesterday dawned. Uh, I've known of this thing for months, maybe a year. But you can't say, my hand, where does the body come in? The reality is you actually say, where does the hand come into the body? And so the question itself is flawed. And it's flawed by virtue of the fact that we have actually allowed a stereotype to continue that it's us and them. Some governors should be in some, some of those meetings with the police, with the prime ministers, with the home secretaries, uh, because I, I, in, in many of the conversations we would have, norms would be absent. And I didn't get it. Because it seemed as if once they were arrested and folks were put in the prisons, that's it. The conversation and you guys sought them out and will only have a conversation with yourself when they're on their way out. My local experience was I now have every two to four weeks 10 to 12 young men and women from our church who perpetually worship with going to the church um, services in the Mount Prison and actually have service in prison. They do, do that because th that is part of their community. Do you all understand what I'm trying to say? So for me, it's recognizing, it's not about prisons, where does the community come in? It's saying this is the community experience and we're taking our worship which is part of our, my community experience, into the prison. And so there's a shift here, a shift that says that we no longer want to try and ostracize the prison from the community. I was in a meeting with David Cameron, and I asked him a very difficult question. At that time, he was the leader of the opposition a few months from becoming prime minister. And I said, there's a big challenge we have with the word ex-offender. Because, you see, the word ex-offender doesn't actually make you very employable. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> Hi, <laughs> I'm an ex-offender. It doesn't really make you very employable. And I said, what are we going to do with it? Now, here's the question, and I, I, I'm posing this question everywhere. He agreed with me, and he said, Nims, I agree. But what do we do to change the name? At the moment, nobody has come up with the right name. I've, 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 you know, I've, I've gone north, east, south, and west, and I'm still asking. Whilst it is important we consider victims, and I'm not playing down victims, I've been a victim of crime, but I do know that if we're going to get it right and give opportunities to those who have served their time, if we continue to label them ex-offender, hi, I'm an ex-offender, it doesn't give them the future we're hoping to get. The government is keen to ensure that we do better for those who have gone into our prisons. What does the community do, or what do we do? Well, we've got to become advocates for change. We've got to become advocates for change because what will happen, and what does happen, is that not only do we have the reoffending rates that happen in many of our communities with those who have already gotten caught up in the criminal justice system, but then the children, now, irrespective of what we say about the stats, the stats are the stats and facts don't lie, we find out that those who have been in prison, their children are very vulnerable. We heard that today. But that vulnerability sometimes um, is reflected in criminal behavior. I had an opportunity of engaging with a young man who shot a police officer in the face. And he was in, the, in prisons for 18 years. But he came out and he worked with us. 
But not only did he work with us, he worked with the police officer because the police officer didn't die. And we had two of them going into schools, teaching young people about forgiveness and reconciliation. That's possible. That's what communities, that's my bit, the bit I'm bringing to this conversation is saying that the third sector, the voluntary sector, are important to what you do in the prisons. But sometimes it's very difficult to get in. That has to be a message to all our inmates. You're not trash. You're valuable. You're just as valuable as everybody else outside. You might have offended. You've done wrong things, but you are still valuable. That's what we do. We put that value back. And we ask for employers to come back and say, yeah, they might have offended, but that doesn't mean they are not sensible. That doesn't mean they can't contribute to society. That doesn't mean they're not going to be able to hold a job down. Our responsibility, all of us, here and in prisons and out of prisons, is not to allow the stigma and the shame of being in prison remain on their offender forever. I want to think about that word, prehabilitation, rather than rehabilitation. Because maybe we talk too often about rehabilitation. If we got the prehabilitation right, then we won't need to spend near 10 billion on rehabilitation. Did you all understand what I'm trying to say? I think we're spending a lot more money when we've gone and done it wrong. Maybe if we started looking at the front end, prehabilitation might work. The young men in the Mount, they spoke about just that sense of fear and the need for acceptance when they come out. Omar spoke about concerns about how he would reunite, he reunite with his family. Cherban spoke about unemployment and finances. Abu said he wants somewhere for advice. Where problems arise, he can readjust to living in the community. Mark spoke about employment and generally resettling back in community and et cetera, et cetera. But I think Cam talked about fear due to lack of family, friends, and no support networks. So when all these things exist, that's what I expect the charities that we have also in this house, St. Giles Trust, the NACROs of the world, the Prison Reform Trust in their mindset and all the things they do, the Alpha for Prisons and so many other charities, that's where we come in. But it's not just the charities, it's also the statutory sector working, the probation services working closely with, the, with these agencies, but it's also the private sector saying we have jobs and um, I recently worked with PWC and the Atkinson Group to provide employment for ex-offenders. And I think that's what we've just got to do, keep providing opportunities.